opening, a couple of songs, there shall be showers of blessing, bringing in the sheaves. We sang, um, I love to tell the story, and we're also going to sing possibly at the close if we have time, we have a story to tell to the nations. Today we're talking about getting the gospel out, making a difference in a world where people are lost and destined for the lake of fire, but Jesus came and died upon the cross that they might be saved. The harvest fields are ready for harvest. Are you there turning in your Bible? I need to turn over there myself to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We looked at this passage two weeks ago, and we talked about Jesus coming and meeting the Samaritan woman at the noon hour, not when they normally went to get water. This woman must have been somewhat of an outcast, and with her immoral life that Jesus was aware of and addressed with her, and uh, it brought change in her life as he presented himself as the Savior, the Messiah. But the disciples weren't there because they had gone to get food. And we're going to be picking up down here in the middle of this chapter, toward the end there, and uh, looking at uh, your mission on the field. Now you say, Pastor, didn't you write that wrong? Uh, and that's kind of a what are you saying there? Your mission on the field. You see, the Pitsleys, when they're on the field, where are they serving? Tell me. Kenya. What country is it? Kenya. Which continent? Africa. What country? Kenya. Say it. Kenya. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's when they are on the field. That's when they are out there serving. Well, guess what, folks? We are on the mission field. Where you live, what you are doing, you are on mission. It's not just that we support through our annual budget missionaries that go out somewhere. We do that. But it's about us right here as well that we, when we are born again into the family of God, we are missionaries for him. And it starts with our own family. It starts with our church family. It starts with our neighbors. It starts with our coworkers and goes out from where we are at. Your mission field. We find on the mission field that people are spiritually blinded and they need to be saved. And on the other hand, those that are earthly focused need to be stirred. If you're a believer, I today desire to stir you toward evangelism. May the word of God stir me and you toward evangelism. We are either a missionary or a mission field, it's been said. Do you like that statement? We are either a missionary or a mission field. So if we're not getting out there with the gospel, we need some help. And so we're all in process. Do we have Philip the evangelist here today? No, we don't. But God has indwelled us with the same spirit, and we are so blessed that we can make a difference in this world. So as we kind of review what John, the gospel writer, has been giving to us in John chapter 1. We're just going to do really quick. This isn't the message, but really quick in John chapter 1, verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Well, Jesus said to them in verse 38, What do you seek? And they said, at the end of verse uh, there, says, Where are you staying? If Jesus said to you, what are you seeking, would you say, um, I feel like, it's like a little kid, it's like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, um, and you just say the first thing that comes to mind, oh, where are you staying? Really? So here's some disciples that need to be brought along a little bit, okay? Um, in chapter 2, verse 19 and following, John 2, you with me? Let's hear those pages turning. You guys awake out there? Okay, good. I know it's been a long week, uh, but uh, I was going to tease Kaylee at camp, but she's the one that's smiling at me the most awake, okay? And she spent a week at camp, okay? All right, sorry, Kaylee. Okay, anyways, back to the message. 2.19 says, uh, 2.19, And Jesus answered and said to them, because they asked him a sign in verse 18, What sign do you give that you're the Messiah? And they answered and said, Jesus answered and said to them, verse 19, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? You see, people are spiritually blind to the truth, as we find here. He gives another uh, illustration, John the Gospel writer under inspiration, in chapter 3, verses 3 and following. 
it says, Jesus answered and said to, to, Nic to uh, Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, you know what he said, How can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? What are you talking about? You see, he was spiritually blind. Okay, that's a problem. Chapter 4, verse 10, we're coming right along. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, do you, or where then do you get that living water? So she, she was blind to the truth that Jesus was presenting, but Jesus was bringing her along. And so here in chapter 4, verse 31, let's start. And in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? You see, not only do the unbelievers need to have their eyes open because they're spiritually blind, but those that are disciples of Christ need to be stirred because in their life we... Uh, lose focus, and we focus upon earthly and temporal things instead of the things that are eternal. When you get to heaven, and everything you and I did last week in the last seven days is shaken down before God at the judgment seat of Christ, how much is going to be ashes, wood, hand, stubble, and how much is going to be gold, silver, precious stones that we really walked with God, pleased God, and served Him? That's what we need to ask ourselves. Do we need to be stirred today? Let's move along in the scripture. Your mission brings the greatest satisfaction. The mission as an ambassador of Christ brings the greatest satisfaction. And that is the passion of the Lord, what he wants for us. You see, he had sent the disciples away back in verse 8. His disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Right? Back in verse 6. Are you with me, John 4, 6? Are you following your Bible? Okay. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied, Jesus was wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. It was noon, okay? This woman comes out, and he says, give me a drink. He's thirsty. We can imagine that, right? It's not like there's a drinking fountain there. The well's there. He doesn't have anything to draw with. She pointed that out. The well's deep. How are you going to get a drink? And so Jesus is uh, weary, Jesus is thirsty, and Jesus is hungry. The, the, the disciples were like, we don't have anything. They want to find something to bring it back for them to eat. So here's Jesus in real need, like you and like me, in our lives. And jumping back over to verse uh, 31. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. This is when the woman had gone back to the city in verse 30. The disciples came. Rabbi, eat. But you know what Jesus said when he was weary, thirsty, and hungry? It doesn't say that the woman gave him anything to drink here. Did the woman give him a drink? Maybe. Probably not. Because he engaged her in conversation. Had she drawn water while they were talking? Maybe. I don't know. So here's Jesus, hungry, thirsty, and weary. And Jesus says this. What is the passion of Jesus? What is the heartbeat of Jesus? What is the zeal of Jesus? Verse 31. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, of which you do not know. And the disciple says, did somebody feed him? And Jesus said, in verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus wasn't all into what they had found to eat. He says, my passion is to help this woman like this Samaritan woman in the city of uh, uh, Sychar, wasn't it, that they are at here and the people that are going to come out this is what I'm about. And he is teaching them. And he wants to give us a boot in the seat of the pants today. Is that rude? <laughs> he wants to shake us up a little bit and say, we got to get the gospel out. He says, are you passionate about what I am passionate about? Are you passionate about those that are lost and destined for hell? And Jesus could say to us today, I died for them. And I have sent you as my ambassadors. All you are doing is representatives of heaven telling people what happened to you telling people what the Bible has written. We're not under the Mosaic Law. 
They don't have to go find the lamb, set it apart, and all this stuff about bringing it, and the blood's got to be in all this. It, we're not under the Mosaic law, folks. Praise God. We are in the church age. Jesus paid it all. He indwells us. He calls the heart. All we do is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. We go, hey. Hey. That's all we have to do. And in so many words. And so Jesus' passion and God's zeal and desire is that, that we would have this interest in others and help them. Jesus understood what it was to have need. Would you look with me at um, uh, Isaiah 40? Well, I got it right there in the screen because I wanted to look at that. Then I said, the psalmist writes in Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. What great verses. John 8, 29. It says, Jesus of the Father, I always do those things that please him. Jesus always pleased the Father. It's the Father's will that we would be ambassadors. Jesus always did his Father's will. And this passion for the Samaritan woman that he could touch her life was the will of God. And he says, it's more important than all this food you're bringing. Folks, we have so much food and so many pleasures in our life. But what are we doing that counts for eternity and for those for whom Christ died? What you're doing, I want to say good job. I'm not trying to whoop on you today and make everybody feel like, you know, we're, we're heels. If you're doing a work for the Lord, praise God for you. Be encouraged. Say, you know what? I'm involved in this. I'm at church today. Good job. You know what? I'm supporting missions in this church intentionally through my tithes and offerings. I am praying for the missionaries. Good job. Well done, folks. I'm trying to live for God before my family. Good job. Before my neighbors. Good job. Your coworkers. Good job, folks. It's the heartbeat of Jesus. And the Spirit is moving us in this. And we need to delight in what Jesus delights in, caring for and saving others. Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. He'll be satisfied. That's what pleases God. That's what satisfies Jesus here. Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, 10. That's why Jesus came. And what are we doing? Why, why did we come? Why are we here on earth right now? We are here as ambassadors, or we, God may just as, loves us so much, he'd probably take us home. But we have some work to do. We have a focus to do. Above our back door as you walk out, do you know what it says above the back door? What does it say? That's right. You are now entering the mission field. Thank you for that. You know what? You and I, probably some of us, we walk by that so many times, we don't even notice it anymore. But it's there. You are now entering the mission field. And, you know, that's, that's to motivate us. That's to encourage us that we are missionaries. And this is our mission field. Your mission on the field, as I put at the top of your notes there. Your mission on the field. You're on the field. And this is our mission. It's the passion of the Father. It's the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the passion of the Holy Spirit that works within us. It's a delight. It's the passion of the church. Turn with me, if you would, as we look at the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Matthew 28. You can keep your marker there in John chapter 4. We'll be coming back here. But Matthew 28... You know, we get so busy serving the Lord that, that, uh, and doing other things. I, I just want to draw your attention to the great, what we call the Great Commission. It's the commission that Christ has commanded for us to do, and it's the great one. Right? That's what we call it, call it that. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go. There's the first word, go. That means to be active. That means to be involved. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the first thing is to go and make a disciple by seeing them saved, and then they're to be baptized. In verse 20, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. What great verses. So we're to make disciples. It's not just about getting somebody to say the prayer or say the words or come to church or be baptized or blah, blah, blah. It's about being born again and then out of obedience of a changed heart and a changed life to obey God's word of which we all desire to do. There's baptism. There's, there's taking steps to, to do what we should. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. So we follow the word. That is what we're about. That's what we're to be doing. Not all have the spiritual gift of evangelist. Ephesians 4.11. Ephesians 4.11. Look over there. Now, Philip was an evangelist. We looked at him uh, probably, what was it, four weeks ago or six weeks ago on our Thursday night program. Um, Ephesians 4.11. Now, listing the spiritual gifts, and here in 4.11 it says, And he himself, Ephesians 4.11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Evangelists. Some people are evangelists. Praise God for the gift of evangelism. Let me ask you today, do you have the gift of evangelism? Somebody asked one time, where are all the evangelists? It used to be people, churches would have evangelistic meetings. I, I could find some, some people that are doing evangelistic work as traveling evangelists. But I want to tell you, I'm not seeing as a pastor, and let me ask you as a, as a Christian, do you know people that are evangelists that have the, or have the gift of evangelism and are getting the gospel out? Where are the evangelists today that have the gift of evangelist as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers? Where are they at? Well, it may be you. Maybe God wants to use you to get the gospel out in a special way. And as you would step out and pursue that and pray about that, where do missionaries come from? For, I got the wrong one off the bulletin board. I meant to have Baptist, let me just make believe this is Baptist church planners. Where does Baptist church planners get church planners? Right here we are, you people at home. Prayer, our local church, right here. If our church is not sending out church planners, there will not be church planners out there. Is it true or false? Unless another church does. Churches like ours that will be concerned for America to send out church planners in America or church planners for another country, we call them foreign missionaries. Baptist Admissions. Um... ABWE. This is their this is their new missionaries guide here. Uh, just to, just to hold it up a little bit. Here's their here's their new missionaries. Praise God. There's a young couple here. There's a there's a, a young couple here. Here's a single uh, young lady. Here's a young couple here. Here's a here's a, uh, a young a young lady, um, young lady, young lady. Um, some some older folks here. Here's some young folks. Um, okay? These are missionaries. Where did these people come from? Did they hatch out somewhere in a tree, in a nest, and they went off to be a missionary? Where do missionaries come from? The Spirit of God working in hearts from people that will have the passion of the Father and the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ that died for the lost and will say, God, what would you have for me to do? I want to serve you. And it's not about us becoming a missionary to Siberia. It's about us having a passion for God that we will start witnessing right now, right where we are at, and making a difference. And I've kind of left the notes. We've got to get back in the PowerPoint, right? Now I'm meddling, right? It's about people like you and me that will say, I want to serve God with a passion to reach the go get the gospel out. And maybe God would be calling you and some of our young people. Hey, Johnny, I'm talking to you. God... Right? Do I got everybody, young people's attention here? Is everybody looking here? 
Um, some of our younger kids down in junior church too. God may be calling you. God may work in your life that you would become a missionary to Siberia or wherever in the world. But God wants you to be a missionary right where you're at right now and be involved in evangelism out of your heart as a passion of the Father, as a passion of the Son, and as a passion of the Holy Spirit, as He has commissioned us to go and to make disciples, and that we are ambassadors. Our citizenship is in heaven, but we are ambassadors here. And we're to take that message. In Matthew chapter 9, 36 to 38, when He saw the multitudes, He was moved. Jesus was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That is for you. That is for others. That is for your children. That is for us as a church, as believers. Are we praying that God would send out laborers? Let's pray right now. For real, okay? You folks at home, pray with us. Lord, we pray that you'll send out laborers into your harvest field. And Lord, may it be me, may it be us, may it be our church, may it be believers across America that Baptist church planners would be hustling to send out and raise support and meet the needs of so many church planners in America that it would just be an amazing thing. Lord, raise up church planners for ABWE, for Baptist Mid Missions, for other missions out there, that our church could maybe be a, a mother church to a church plant, that we would get behind a brother and a sister that's doing a work for you and get the gospel out that people would be born again. Help us, Lord. Touch our young people. Touch our marrieds, our single folks. Touch our middle age and our seniors. Stir this pastor, stir our teachers, stir our, our, our trustees and our, our deacons. Stir us, Lord. Help us to ever focus on what you are. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Keep praying that as we, as we think about this message. Your mission involves reaching people with the gospel and discipleship. Jesus says here back in John 4 and verse 34, he says, and Jesus said to them, my food is to do. It's doing the work. That means studying your Sunday school lesson, teachers, right? That means it's going to take some extra work to get the, the junior church lesson together. It's going to take some extra work to have Amber working in the nursery today to, to try and help moms like this. No, really, right? Thank you, Amber, and others working in the nursery, right? To, to do the will of him who sent me. It takes us all working together. The mower was out here flying around chopping grass this week. People were talking about putting uh, fascia back on the church where the, the nail popped. I, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Thank you, Mike, for working in the sound booth and Jasmine today. I mean, do you ever notice Mike and Jasmine back there and Heather's organizing the songs? Thank you, guys. I mean, this all goes into what's going on for the church work. But it's the doing of the work. It means that we're going to have to say no to some other things because God's work is a priority. Because God is a priority. We're going to have to say no to the ball. We're going to have to say no to maybe getting our own uh, fascia nailed back on. I don't know if any of you have any fascia popped loose. Okay? I'm just saying. God's work is going to take some work. And it's okay that we work and that we spend some time serving God and we make it a priority in our life. Are you serving God? Amen? doing the work. Be encouraged in how you're doing the work. I don't want this to be negative because you folks are, it's like, well, we're here today and now we're getting the whoop, right? And uh, no, I want to encourage you. Everybody's doing so much, but we got to keep focused. I mean, the, the disciples lost focus here. Did somebody already bring him something to eat, right? It went over their head. Either we're a missionary or a mission field. Are you a missionary? If not, you need to be, a, you're a mission field. I'm trying to, God's trying to reach us today, right? Be encouraged and, and delight to reach and support and pray. Are you delighting in that? And what gets in the way? Romans 12, 1 is we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. What's getting in the way? Are you getting the work of God done? Kick it out of the way. Plow through. Change your schedule. Say, I can't do that. Or I'm not going to do that. Whoops. Sorry about that. And uh, get after it for God. Romans 12, 1. Present your body a living sacrifice. It's, it's progressive. Is progressing in the work to completion. Verse 34, let's read that again. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, 
and to finish his work. Bring it to completion. Let's, do you want to finish strong? Do you want to finish faithful? When I lay in my casket, I don't want my kids to walk by and go, well, he was a good pastor for 30 years, but then he, uh, you know, fell away. I don't want that. I want to finish the way God wants me to finish. How about you? Are you going to finish the work? Are you going to keep going? Your mission requires intentional involvement. Intentional involvement. Verse 35. Would you read verse 35 out loud with me? I'm reading here in the New King James. It says, would you read it with me? 35. Do you not... Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready white for harvest. Right? Now, John MacArthur points out on that that it was just probably like in January uh, when they were planting, and it was four months until the normal spring harvest in April. The crops were planted now, and the grain would be sprouting vibrant and green in the fields. And they, they, he says to them, don't say the harvest is coming in four months. Right there at that field. Don't say the harvest is coming in four months. And Jesus, we can picture it. I don't know if it's exactly the way it was. But Jesus could look down the trail and he says, how does he say it? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he sees the Samaritan woman coming down the path. He sees all the other people there uh, following her. He says, lift up your eyes. Don't be looking down here saying, well, we'll just take it easy, and eventually we'll have a harvest. He says, today's the day when we're to lead people to Christ. When are you going to lead that coworker to Christ? Forty years from now? Next year? Next week? Today is the day of salvation. Let's be about the work today. And, of, of course, God closes and opens doors. We've got to pray about that, that God would give us wisdom, what to speak and when. But let's be, let's be about it. Why not today? Why not share the gospel with them today? Why not be straight up with them and say, you know what, I care about you, and look them in the eye with that love that God will give you. And tell them about Jesus, what happened to you, what God did in your life. Expect a harvest now. Lead somebody to the Lord tomorrow, today. When you go to work tomorrow, lead them to the Lord tomorrow. Just don't witness to them about your testimony a little bit. If they're receptive and the Holy Spirit's at work, tell them the whole gospel. If God's at work, say, would you like to pray and receive Jesus as your Savior right now? Are you ready to do that? You've got to do that sometime in your life. Ask him, is right now the moment? Are you ready to receive the Lord? Will you do that? Jesus says, Don't, it's not four months from now. Right now is the time. Here they come down the road, we could say. And determine to do all that you can. Verse 36. Oh, 35. We've got to read that again. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white unto harvest. And I forgot I had this here. This was my sermon illustration. They're already white to harvest. I mean, this grass, I don't want this anywhere near my garden. Do you, Sean? This, this is grass seed, buddy. This is bad grass seed. Okay, can you see that? I got grass seed in here. Can you folks at home see it? It's going to make some bad weeds. Determine to do all that you can. Now's the time to harvest. If you were planting grass, you would want this. It's, almost, it's not quite dry. It's a little bit green. Let's bring the harvest in, folks. Determined to do all that you can because it goes on. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. You see, maybe, maybe you're going to be here in New York praying and your child's living in where? Nevada, let's say. You can pray that God will send somebody to cross their path. And Oh, we do have somebody that's got their daughter in Nevada. And so pray that somebody would cross the path with your daughter. And talk to them about the Lord and be a witness. And there they are, working at work with somebody, doing what they're doing. And uh, somebody is next to them, another Christian, and they're witnessing to them. And lo and behold, they, they find this gospel track. And then they turn on the radio after work and they're driving home. And what do they find? This Christian station. And right at the right time, they turn it on. It's as if God is speaking to them and telling them the ways of God and the way to be safe. This is how God works. 
But we are here in New York, and somebody's living in Nevada, and their daughter's here in New York, let's say. And they work next to you, and they're your neighbor, and God wants to use you to get the gospel to them. Let's get the gospel out. Determine to do all that we can. Your mission brings eternal benefit. You will be rewarded. He who sows, where was it here? Verse 36. And he who reaps receives wages. God's going to reward his people for his faithfulness. Now, should we serve just because we're being rewarded? No. That's not why we're doing it. And if we are, we're all we're messed up, right? But we want to please God. And we do want a crown to cast at his feet if that's the way it's going to work out, right? I don't know. Are we going to have a chance to go before him someday? Who's casting the crowns there? Those that you have redeemed us, they say. We're going to be casting the crowns there. Are we going to have a chance to give something back to God and say, Lord, I served you down there on earth, and here it is. Oh, God, I worship you. And we'll have something to give. We're going to be standing there like the kid I mentioned at the beginning of the message. Uh, uh, whoa, where do you sleep? I mean, we're not going to have anything to give. We'll just be kind of like, we want to serve God because we're going to be rewarded. It's going to be to God's glory, not to our pride. Proverbs 30, uh, 11, 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. This is just a great verse. And he who wins souls is wise. That's just a great verse. We could talk a lot about that. For what is your hope, joy, and crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 to 20. People that you lead to the Lord had a part, and God's going to reward you for that. You will have part in bringing souls to Christ. Jude one twenty three says, But others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even hating the garments defiled by the flesh. Pull them out of the fire, folks. That's what our job is. It's as if they're already starting, their pant leg is hot. You ever get too close to the bonfire? Pretty soon your, your blue jeans like cooking, and you're like, Whew. right? People are on the verge of being in hell. Some will die today without Christ. Did they cross our path, and did we have opportunity to make a difference in their life, and did we? We've got to be intentional. We need to be involved in this. It brings eternal benefit. A guy was walking down the beach, and he saw a guy throwing starfish in the water that were kind of beached and up out of the water. And uh, he was winging one at a time back into the water. And a guy walked by and says, what are you doing? You're not, I mean, there's, there's thousands of them. And the guy said, I might not be changing, saving all of them, but this starfish cares about it as he threw it back in the water. And this starfish cares about it. It made a difference in that starfish's life. Maybe you can't touch billions or millions of people, but folks, we can touch many. Will we do it for him? It makes a difference to that soul as we witness for the Lord. You will bring rejoicing in heaven. I wish we had time to look at Luke uh, 15, 7. Do you remember the uh, parable of the lost sheep? There was much rejoicing. Uh, and then it says there in verse 10 with the uh, lost coin, there's much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. And then the prodigal son in verse 20 and his brother that uh, uh, God rejoices when people return to him. There's rejoicing in heaven. You want to make a party in heaven today? Do you want the angels to be up there where there's rejoicing going on? Who's rejoicing? Is it God? Is it the angels? Is it the saints who went on before? I mean, there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. There's rejoicing. You want to bring joy in heaven? Get out there and witness and lead somebody to the Lord. Amen? And expect them to come to the Lord. Talk to them and pray with them that they'll be saved. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We sang, bringing in the sheaves. Keep taking the seed. Keep planting. If you never plant, you never water, you're never going to harvest. Right? Let's do it. Let's keep after it, folks. We've got to do it for God. Affirm your good work for the gospel. In conclusion, will you affirm what you are doing for God? Maybe I've been pushing you a little bit today, challenging you, the word of God, the Holy Spirit. That's good, right? Stirring us to be a witness. Will you affirm what you are doing? Thank God for everybody that does so much around here. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. Will you pray to the Lord to send forth laborers into his harvest? And maybe God's calling at your heart to 
get the gospel out to someone. Maybe be a missionary. Maybe you'll be a Baptist church planner, church planner someday. Some of you here today, some of our young people. We can go out and visit Baptist church planners. We can see what they got going on. We can see how it works. Let's do it. If there's an interest there. Will you be intentional in your witness and discipleship this week? Intentional. It's a priority. It's the passion of God. Will you have his passion as your passion? The fields are ready for harvest, Jesus said. And as he says this, uh, verse 37, For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So many of the Samaritans had come to him. He urged them, or they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, verse 41. And many more believed because of his own words. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe because of what you said, and we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the, what's the last word? World. He's the savior of the world, folks. Are there some that you're prejudiced against or would look down on or that are repulsive? Maybe the way they look or talk or act, he died to save the world, you and me and everyone else. Would you stand with me as we conclude with a song we've a story to tell to the nations? Oops, it's in our hymnal. Here we go. 446.